Um, so uh, we're in a city of rock stars, of course. We've, um, you have the Beatles here before, many other amazing bands that we've grown up with over the years. But the new rock stars of today are microbiologists, virologists, epidemiologists. They've taken over Twitter and social media and Instagram. And so it's great to now hear about where we are with uh, infections and the whole world of infectious disease. So we're really pretty pleased to announce our next speaker, Professor Janet Hemingway, who's been the Managing Director of Liverpool Tropical School of Medicine, and now she runs a, a new company called uh, Icon, which I understand has been invested heavily, and it's going to be amazing how we figure out the future of how we manage infections. Before you start, I'm going to move these out of the way, just to give you some space, <laughs> and then possibly come through. Janet, the floor's yours. You even get your rock star <laughs> entrance. <laughs> thank you very much, Effie, and thank you very much for the invitation to talk at this first joint um, virtual and live meeting in Liverpool today. Um, it's great to be back in front of a live audience, even though we're a relatively sparse audience, uh, exactly as we would anticipate on this first day of um, the world being a little more open, certainly this bit of the world being a little bit more open. What I wanted to talk to you about today is the new ICON consortium that we set up back in September of 2020. Um, it was about 12 months before that that the idea was conceived to put this program together. Um, and we were really in the right um, place at the right time then when the COVID pandemic hit, um, although clearly the conception of this had been well before anybody had heard of COVID. So um, if I move on, what were we actually doing? Um, we're actually looking at um, developing things for the anti-infectives landscape um, that are really going to revolutionise the speed at which we can get new products out to market. And what do I mean by products? Um, I mean everything from antibiotics, drugs, vaccines, diagnostics, and public health insecticides. Because when we've looked at all of these, they've all got similar issues in terms of very limited pipeline um, and problems getting them through to market. And that will be very familiar to anybody who's used to working in this anti-infectives uh, landscape because you've got a, a very big portfolio of molecules coming in there. You've got a very high attrition rate. You've got very limited profits for industry getting into this market. Um, and so there's very little incentive, or has been until recently, very little incentive to innovate. And so we found two things have happened. One is the pipelines have not got filled. Um, and the other is that it takes a, a lot of time and money to actually get a new anti-infective through to the market, way more than it should. Um, and we've seen that um, really with the vaccines and diagnostics that we've got for COVID, where we've managed to speed that process up. And part of what I would love to see is that process getting speeded up, not just for COVID vaccines and diagnostics, but for all drugs, vaccines, diagnostics, um, for infectious diseases more broadly. So what's the consortium that we've set up? Um, well, it was funded um, primarily through the Strength in Places um, initiative from UKRI. So we bid for 18.6 million pounds of UKRI funding which allowed us to bring a consortium of NHS partners, academia and industry together. So we have six core partners. Um, but along from there, um, a lot more partners in the broader network. So there are 64 local businesses, all within the Liverpool City region or Cheshire and Warrington, who are already working with us. Um, and another 120 I call them businesses, but they're businesses and organisations because we've got everything from philanthropic donors to large multinationals um, within that 120 who are already collaborating with us. And again, remember, this only started up in September of last year. So that's phenomenal growth uh, and interest over the time period. Uh, we have been uh, one of the few uh, organisations, I think, that has benefited from COVID 
um, given that we were really in the right place at the right time when this started up. So what are we doing to actually improve uh, the way we get uh, new things through to the market? When we actually looked at where the problems were and where the failures were, we found these were at similar points and they went everywhere from early stage discovery through to actually having your product, but um, then not knowing where you should sensibly place it in the market to get the greatest impact out of that product once you've got it placed. And so the kind of engine that I've got um, on the screen here gives you some idea of how we're starting feeding into the bottom of that um, system with a, a natural products library and high throughput screening system uh, run collaboratively with AstraZeneca and Unilever um, through all the way to a, a multi-country program um, looking at where we actually put our products into the marketplace. So we have um, seven real platforms um, and two virtual platforms that we're offering. And the idea here is that these can be used for multiple diseases, um, for multiple product types, um, and they're open access for industry, whether you're a, a small industry or a large industry, to actually work with us. The actual physical platforms are all, at the moment, sitting in the north of England, um, either in the Liverpool city region or in Cheshire and Warrington, based in Alderley Park. Uh, the virtual platforms are run from here, um, but we're operating in several countries, um, really working out where the best place is to test the products that we're working and looking at. So what are we trying to do? Um, we're actually um, trying to make sure that we become the first choice for anti-infectives um, translational research. Um, and that's taking it through early stage innovation, um, developing new SMEs, um, collaborating uh, across the network to make sure that we get those infective therapeutics rapidly through to market, um, and doing that in, in a very efficient format. In terms of outputs, um, a long time, alongside developing um, new spin-out companies, um, we are also going to expand the local ecosystem for infection R&D here in the Liverpool city region. Um, it is already worth around £2 billion a year if we go look at the Liverpool city region plus Cheshire and Warrington, um, but we have the ambition of turning that into a £3 billion a year activity over the next 10 years, and we think that is entirely feasible. That, in turn, is going to create new jobs. Um, we've already created um, over 130 new jobs um, in the last few months, uh, and there's a lot more to come, and it will drive um, GVA and the local economy as well. So alongside benefiting healthcare, impacting on public health, uh, and taking things through to the market. There's a big regional incentive in terms of getting this right. So what's our offering to industry? Um, it is, as I say, these platforms of technology that we want people to come and work with us. Um, and those go all the way from a, an early hits to leads, if people have an idea for a, a new molecule they want to take through. Um, or they're searching for a particular molecule, we can help at that stage. Um, through the next stage of um, early development of that product before you get it anywhere near a clinical trial. And there we want you to, if you're going to fail, fail early and fail cheaply. Um, so we have um, organoid models, uh, we have PKPD models, um, and then we move on to a human challenge model that's an early stage clinical trial. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about a number of these different platforms. So our offering to industry isn't just around um, COVID. Um, we pivoted towards COVID for a lot of the activities um, when we um, set up. But um, we were originally thinking that we were going to be doing a lot around antimicrobial resistance, and that is still true. 
Um, and for that, um, we have a huge natural product library, um, which is part of our citizen science program that's been running for many years, um, where we get people to swab pretty much almost anything you might want to. Um, and all we ask once you've made that swab is that you send the swab to us in a, a sealed tube, um, telling us what you swabbed, where you swabbed it, and when. Um, we will culture up anything that is on that swab um, and put it on a series of plates that allows us to test um, whether the bugs that uh, are on that swab are producing anything interesting in terms of new antibiotic activity. So we can test against um, multi-resistant um, bugs that are there. And on the plate that you see here, um, you can see a couple of samples from some of those swabs where we clearly, where you've got a, a clear area on the plate around the uh, bug that's growing, have that bug producing something that is interesting. We have literally hundreds of thousands of these samples all producing interesting things. Um, and we're busy fractionating those at the moment um, and putting those onto a high throughput screening platform um, that industry would use, which is where AstraZeneca comes in. Um, we can then allow industry to screen this library to pull out molecules that are of interest. Um, smaller companies could also look at um, screening some of our smaller um, libraries. So, uh, for example, you might want to screen our soil library or our animal library or our home library um, where the samples have, have been collected from. But I think this is going to be the source of some really interesting new molecules coming out over the next few years. So that's part of the developing um, new things for AMR. Um, we then want to make sure that we can provide the platforms to take those through. So for small companies, we have a, a specific hits to leads program because what we often find is that small companies, um, when they have something interesting, don't really understand what they need to do to get that small molecule to the point that they can put it into a phase one clinical trial. And so our hits to lead program um, works with the SME to actually work out whether this is something that really should go into a clinical trial or not, to raise the funding to be able to get through to that point um, and then take them through into the clinical trial. And our NHS partner then has the ability to work with us to undertake those phase one clinical trials. Once we've actually got um, products to that point, um, there then is a multi-country study um, in Malawi, Uganda and the UK, um, looking at where we best utilize those products, how we manage to uh, have good stewardship of the products and where we're going to get the greatest impact from. Moving on to a slightly different area now, um, I want to say a little bit about organoids um, and why this is going to change the way in which we actually take through new products. Because at the moment, what tends to happen is that people have their molecule, um, they take it through the standard process of testing on microtiter plates, um, and then step by step, it goes through into a, a clinical trial. But we find as soon as you get these things into something that looks like man, um, or often once you do put it into first in man, you get a quite a high failure rate at that point. And we wanted something that allowed us to fail earlier if these things were going to fail. So we've been developing with a range of different companies um, something that moves from this microtiter plate type system um, where you would do your classic titrations um, of your drug to look at efficacy. Um, we can still do that but to something that looks like this um, in a plate. Um, and this is our lung model, um, where in this particular um, microtiter plate system, we have something that looks and behaves like a, a living human lung. Um, so by using uh, a number of basal cells that we can pull together in the right format, um, we have tissues that um, go all the way up to the, the upper layer that you see here, 
of beating cilia exactly like you would have in a, a human lung. And being able to do high throughput screening on that um, in a category three type system um, is much better, we believe, than doing that um, just in a, a standard microtiter plate format as you do at the moment, because this takes it much closer uh, to the human model um, much faster. Moving on then to the point that you do get to uh, a clinical trial, uh, again, we believe there are better ways uh, with many things of doing these clinical trials. Um, so we'd already started when we put the, the bid in for this particular consortium, developing up a human challenge model for pneumococcus. Um, and we had uh, various companies already starting to work with us on their uh, vaccine technology uh, to look at that human challenge system. The human challenge system that we have up and running is beneficial because it takes fewer people, uh, it's safer, it's quicker, and it's cheaper to do. And so uh, at about a tenth of the cost that it would take to do a, a phase one clinical trial, we can do a very safe trial that is going to tell you whether or not um, you're going to fail at that point or whether uh, your product is going to go through safely. Now, um, it's very obvious when uh, COVID struck that the sort of facilities and the expertise that we had uh, were very well placed to deal with COVID as well. Um, and so, as Steve Rotherham's already alluded to, when Oxford and AstraZeneca started to develop their vaccine, uh, we were asked whether we would um, act as the northern hub for assessing that vaccine, uh, which we did. We expanded our facilities from the five bed facility, outpatient facility that we had very rapidly to a, an 18 bed facility. Uh, so what you see here was actually a, a standard lab um, about sort of nine months ago, um, but is now fully operational. And we're looking to expand these facilities again so that we can take uh, the COVID vaccine activities into potentially a human challenge model for that. Alongside that, we'll be offering the human challenge for flu. Um, we're also looking at um, RSV um, and potentially also uh, a multi-drug resistant TB model that we believe over time we can get into this format. All very exciting for the um, large and small companies who are working in this area who will then have access to be able to test things first in man in a very much quicker format than they can at the moment. On to something um, slightly different again then, in terms of what we're doing um, with the randomized control trials. Um, here we're looking at some of the public health insecticides um, and how we do better randomized control trials to work out whether these things actually work in real life. And uh, we worked out a, a couple of years ago, really, um, that where we had products coming into the market or wanting to get into the market, which we could guarantee were at least as good uh, and probably better than products that were already on the market, um, we could and should potentially take these into operational use and run the randomized control trial um, within an operational setting. So we did this for some public health insecticides um, on bed nets that are used to control malaria and managed to run the world's largest ever um, bed net trial in Uganda. That bed net trial was embedded in the operational program with the Ugandan Ministry of Health and effectively allowed us to set up a, a four-arm randomized control trial um, that used the whole uh, of Uganda and its national um, bed net delivery program um, two years ago. On the back of that, and because we could stratify different areas of Uganda so that we had different levels of transmission um, going on there, we were able to generate data that in that single trial, which actually um, cost only about a, a tenth of the cost of a normal standalone randomized control trial. Um, the data that the WHO were able to put a interim recommendation out on in terms of how these new uh, bed nets should be used. 
and we're about to give them the final data this year, and we believe that there will be a policy um, recommendation then coming out of the World Health Organization that will impact the way that these bed nets are used going forward. Um, but a much better and a much cheaper way of, of actually doing that. We believe we can improve on that again. So as part of the ICON consortium, we're working in the Democratic Republic of Congo um, with, again, the Ministry of Health there. And that is allowing us to do uh, a slightly different format of the randomized control trial using the antenatal clinic data that is coming out of the country, improving the way that they gather that data. Um, and we believe that way we will reduce the cost even further of getting these products through to market. Um, and what we can do in this format, um, I believe we will be able to take out more broadly into other formats with new products. But we're also looking at diagnostics. So we're not all about um, drugs and molecules. Um, everybody's heard an awful lot about diagnostics um, with lateral flow tests and PCR tests, and I'll say a little bit about those at the moment. But we've also got some novel electromagnetic wave technology that we've been working with um, under the ICON program that allows us to measure um, things using those electromagnetic waves in handheld devices that are relatively um, cheap uh, to produce once you've got the technology right. And what you see on the screen here is the prototype that we already have up and running for measuring insecticides on surfaces. Um, and this should revolutionize the way that we're able to quality control indoor residual spray programs um, for malaria, visceral leishmaniasis, uh, and other uh, infectious diseases. Uh, because for the first time in the hands of the spray operatives, you can give them a device that says how well have they sprayed that system or where you've got a bed net. Um, is that bed net up to the right quality in terms of having the right active ingredient on it? And you don't need a PhD to be able to read the results. Um, it's a simple readout using a, an LED light function. Um, so all you need to look at is whether you've got a green or amber light, you're within the tolerances that you want. If you've got a red light at the top, you're way over sprayed or over treated, a red light at the bottom, you've got no insecticide there. The similar set of technologies we're using to be able to measure parasites directly in peripheral blood without needing to take a blood sample. Um, and so again, uh, we think that is going to improve diagnostics hugely for anything that is circulating um, in the peripheral bloodstream. And uh, we're working at the moment uh, to do that for lymphatic filariasis, um, where that's a real problem because it, the parasites only circulate in the peripheral blood late at night. So if you have to go and get people's blood um, in the early hours of the morning, um, that is problematic if you can give them a patch using this electromagnetic wave technology to wear, um, and it tells you whether or not those parasites are circulating, um, a much more efficient way of doing that. And we hope that technology should be out uh, within the next two or three years. Um, and I should say a big thank you to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation um, who've worked with us on this and provided um, just over three million pounds of the programme um, to actually take some of this technology forward. But we also work on standard diagnostics. Um, and so we came into this programme as a FIND accredited centre for validation of diagnostics, FIND being the big product development partnership for uh, diagnostics. And we're also a World Health Organisation accredited centre. Um, and we can also um, help companies take things through to registration within the UK. Um, so we've been working with a whole range of different companies there to actually make sure that the great ideas that have come through not only the Liverpool city region, uh, but nationally and internationally, um, get turned into new effective tests um, and... Um, that uh, has been done, I think, to date with about 23 different companies that we've worked with. Some of them, their products haven't worked particularly well, and they've gone back uh, to the drawing board and improved what they've got. Some of those products have been really good. 
Um, and I'm delighted to say that a number of those are already on the market, already have registrations and are being used in huge numbers um, in the UK and internationally. And we also uh, can look at, at COVID on surfaces as well. So while we'd never thought about COVID, we did have the facilities within the ICON program uh, to be able to do that because we had access to category three labs. We had access uh, to virologists within our program who were used to handling things like the dengue virus and other things that needed that kind of careful handling. And so we were very um, rapidly able to work with a whole range of different companies um, looking to see whether they had products that would kill or inactivate uh, COVID virus on a range of different surfaces. Um, and this is a collaboration that we set up um, with the Ministry of Defence here in the UK, who clearly wanted something uh, to be able to utilise very quickly. Um, and the product Virus End, um, that we work with them on developing and validating um, is now in operational use um, and they're able to, uh, to take that through um, and use it to keep um, the um, armed forces safe um, while they're operating in, in different environments there. So that technology um, is already out there in the press. There are a huge number of other products and companies that we're working with to be able to see whether or not um, the uh, virus um, actually sort of can be um, reduced or completely eliminated from different surfaces safely uh, with the products that are, are actually out there. So uh, another example that I don't have a slide for, but again hit the press fairly recently, um, was mouthwash um, that Unilever have been working with um, showing that we could actually, through the products that they have, um, completely um, inactivate the virus um, from saliva from people who had that um, with their mouthwash products. So I think just from those few examples I've given you, um, it's obvious that the sort of platform technology I've been talking about, although we set those platforms up, um, not knowing that COVID was coming uh, down the track at us, um, have demonstrated how relatively easy it is if you've got that kind of platform technology and that kind of expertise to be able to pivot it uh, to any infectious disease um, if you know what you're doing with these things. Um, and so we really have already demonstrated, I think far earlier than we anticipated doing, um, our ability to be able to utilise these platforms uh, very quickly. We then also want to make sure that these products are optimally placed. Um, and I've already mentioned the three country study that we've got in Malawi, Uganda um, and the UK, because it was obvious to us early on that antibiotic resistant bacteria were being shed into the environment and a lot of the dispersal then was happening uh, through, for example, sewage, water or soil. Um, and it was also obvious to us very early on that that was going to happen with COVID. And so we started looking at that very quickly um, as COVID hit uh, and were able to look at shedding hotspots from care homes, from hospitals in the UK um, and from similar places in Uganda and Malawi, alongside animal husbandry facilities, uh, particularly where we were looking um, at AMR. And a lot of the work that we've done there has led to some of the modelling that's gone on with Public Health England and the Environmental Agency in the UK, and to some government policy changes here in the UK. It's also led directly to policy changes in Malawi, as they've got the information through from our systems there. And really, really hot off the presses because we haven't even put the press release out there. Um, this network is expanding very rapidly. So literally this week, we welcome the Nanotherapeutics Hub um, to join ICON. The Nanotherapeutics Hub, based in the University of Liverpool, um, uses lipid nanotechnology for small molecules that you find difficult to get to your target site. 
Um, and with a lot of the new technologies that are coming down the track, um, we believe this will be another exciting new platform uh, that we will be able to offer under the ICOM banner. I should also say that although big companies come and work with us, and we have the likes of Pfizer, GSK, AstraZeneca, Bayer, and so on, already working with us, um, we really are keen to make sure that small companies can work with us as well and really drive that innovation pipeline across uh, the different spectrum of companies in the Liverpool city region. And so we were delighted to get 6.6 .6 million of European funding um, from the Liverpool city region, which allows us to give SMEs access to our platform technology. So if we have small companies who are interested in working with us, um, we can work with you and we can provide some of the funding for you to be able to work with us as well, which is great news for everybody. Um, and that's really for, for those companies starting off, we've called it formulations, but it's formulations very broadly um, on three different work streams. So I'm just going to finish there by saying a big thank you again to the organizers. Um, we are, as ICON, open for business. Um, we are expanding rapidly, um, and we are working in the global marketplace um, based here in Liverpool. So we would love to hear more from you if anybody has any issues, problems with their product development that they think we could help with, um, or would like to join within the ecosystem that we're developing here, please do get in touch and you'll see the details um, on the bottom there. Thank you. Thank you, Janet, so much. Thank you for that. Um, just a quick question for you, Janet. We've got to talk about inequity of health, mm. uh, back to inequity at the moment, and how we manage that. What are your thoughts on that uh, as someone who's been involved in this field for a long time? Sure. Um, so um, I worked as the, the um, director of the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine for 17 years before I, I took on um, ICON and, and running that. So um, I am hugely passionate that we need global solutions for infectious diseases. We need global solutions for a lot of them, but particularly for infectious diseases. Um, these things don't carry passports. They move over borders quite happily. And with the interconnected world that we've got now, it's in everybody's interest to make sure that everybody has access to these products. So everything that we do has a target product profile that should make it available for everybody. Um, I think where the cost is outside that range that we need to be working together to see how we can sort out that access. And with your specific question on that vaccine front, um, I believe we need to make those vaccines available for everybody. I mean, as I was driving in this morning, they were reporting that they were 120 million vaccine doses short um, from the um, COVAC initiative that is already there. Um, in part because India, quite rightly, has, has decided it can't export the vaccines that it was going to export to COVAC while it's still yeah. uh, trying to handle its problem there. But I think then it behoves those countries like the UK and others um, who can help um, bridge that gap to do something about that because just dealing with it on our own borders is not going to solve this problem. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Janet. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so who's had the vaccine? Me. Who's had the second dose of vaccine? Yeah, me. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Who's got the NHS app? Have you seen your thing today? It's all there, isn't it? All your information on your, both your vaccines? Because your passports, so you can travel today and leave Liverpool with your passport. So but if you don't have it, please download the NHS app. It's amazing. It's going to be a vaccine passport in the future if you want to travel in the next few months. Um, so before the pandemic, just before that... Um, about a year before that, I was in uh, Berlin with the Bayer team. Uh, and Bayer set up this thing called G4A, and my friend and good colleague called Eugen Brokovich, who literally traveled around the world trying to bring innovation into the heart of pharma. And pharma were very old-fashioned, um, not particularly wanting to change and, uh, their way of working, but he forced them to think more about innovation. <laughs>